Welcome to the show. Tonight, the Prime Minister ducks out to a winery instead of to the crisis in Alice Springs. Plus, a desperate government throws another billion dollars at its failing renewable energy revolution. And look at the rich guy it helps. And the backlash to actors protesting fashionably for Palestine. It costs the Sydney Theatre Company up to 20 jobs. Also tonight, my tips of the week, including the latest book of a crime writer who sets his book around my town. He's big in Germany, this bloke. Doesn't get all the attention here he deserves. And my whiskey today comes from just up the road as well. And it's all because the bloke who makes it once entered a competition to say in 25 words or less why he'd want to go to Scotland. And look now, for from little bits of luck, your world can change. But first, is it time for his haters to apologise to Tony Abbott? For decades now, we have been doing exactly the wrong thing with Aboriginal policy. Completely the wrong thing because of a disastrous leftist ideology. And the violence in Alice Springs this week is the proof of it. I mean, never in my life have I seen this kind of lawlessness, this total breakdown of order in some Aboriginal communities. The menace that the police commission today said his police in the Alice had to deal with on Tuesday. Policing is a very dangerous job and they were put at threat um, when they attended that job at Hidden Valley. There was uh, numerous people there, over 150 people. Lots of weapons, axes, machetes, knives. I mean, all those tens of billions of dollars we spend on Aboriginal Australians every year on this whole Aboriginal industry, and this is what we get in Alice Springs, for instance? Liberal Senator Karen Little, who was born there, was asking almost all the right questions today. So I asked the question when I looked at that vision, where are the services that were um, gifted to do their work, uh, the hundreds of millions of dollars that went into Central Australia, where was the intelligence that told them that there were issues brewing in those town camps? Where was the people who are supposed to be running buses to get people home? Where are the youth services that were supposed to be keeping an eye on these kids? It just seems that the intelligence that informed what was brewing here was absent. But the one question she didn't ask there is, where were the parents of these children? But yes, that spending, it does seem that the more we spend, the worse it gets in some places. The children, we've never had to rescue and remove so many Aboriginal children ever. Despite all the propaganda about the so-called stolen generations, more than 22,000 Aboriginal children now live in out-of-home care. More than 10 times more likely to have to be removed. So this two-week curfew on children. That's already been imposed on Alice Springs. That is nothing more than a band-aid. The fact that this was all that the Prime Minister could offer today, and it was actually the Northern Territory Government's decision anyway, shows us now bankrupt of ideas. There has been a temporary uh, curfew uh, port there in Alice Springs. That is a sensible move and one that the Federal Government supports. So here's more proof that we have now come to a total dead end with current policies. We spend even more, send in more police, create even more bureaucracies. These aren't the answers long term, you know that. Which may be why the Prime Minister has gone only once to Alice Springs for a few hours 14 months ago and didn't seem keen to go back again when asked by journalists. I have visited the Northern Territory nine times. My minister, Linda Burney, was in Alice Springs at the beginning of last week. Oh, she was there, was she? And did exactly what? So Albanese decided to go today to somewhere a lot more fun. I, I don't want to spoil the next one out, the, the next <laughs> visit, which is uh, to uh, a, a winery. And that's where you found him while Alice Springs was in chaos, admiring the plonk and saying we could sell more of it. And indeed, just this evening, uh, China has announced an end to its ban on Australian wine. What we do. Let me now tell you where I think we've gone so catastrophically wrong. For decades, we have been told that, you know, the real, the authentic Aborigines are very different from the rest of us and they've got to be kept different. Uh, they were the ones out bush in particular, not so much in the cities. They had to be kept there too, in touch supposedly with their culture, with their land, 
and not to be really assimilated into this wicked white society. I exaggerate a bit, but not by much. And so we poured billions of dollars, I mean, literally billions of dollars, tens of billions, hundreds over the years into welfare programs to keep Aborigines in outback settlements, uh, where there was often no work, might never be real work, where there was sometimes little hope, few services, and often no reason the children there could see to go to school. And where in some places violence and dysfunction have been the worst. Now I want to read out something to you. And warning, it's you may find it distressing, but it helps to tell you where I'm I'm coming from. I've been coming from for decades now. Because it was around 25 years ago that I first realised the the shocking levels of poverty and violence and child abuse in some Aboriginal communities out bush. And realised how crazy it was to spend billions to keep Aboriginal children there. That was when I read a report from a 1999 task force led by Aboriginal academic Professor Bonnie Robertson, great woman, leading a team of about 50 Aboriginal women who went around Queensland trying to find the truth. And in a column I wrote back then, I quoted this passage from their report, and it's just one example of many, evidence from a nurse. And again, apologies, it's so graphic. The nurse. I saw this girl who came in, cuffed in police custody. She was only 14 years old. She was charged with shoplifting in town. Her mother was called and through the discussion disclosed that she was concerned her daughter had the pox. She was brought inside the sexual health services for checkup. I have never seen a girl so. I can't actually tell you the words, they're just too graphic. Let's just say it was she had severe internal injuries. She goes on this nurse. She screamed all the way through the consultation. Turns out she'd been sexually assaulted since the age of three. She's the first person I've ever seen where I thought, there is no hope for you. Now, in one of the towns that Bonnie Robertson's task force visited, 17 young Aborigines had killed themselves in one year. Three children died of neglect. Let me tell you one more thing. The Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Commission back then, the version then of The Voice, later scrapped, abolished. All it could come up with to fight domestic violence after hearing this report was $1 million. One. In the meantime, it spent $12 million a year just on conferences and $15 million a year on PR, on communications. And that's how it's always been. The Aboriginal industry finds it much easier, more lucrative, to attack white society. Oh, it's your fault, you know, you owe, you pay us, reparation, whatever. I mean, I know there are many honourable exceptions. Generalising. That for many, it's been much easier to do that than to focus on Aboriginal families and what's now called Aboriginal culture, to focus on personal responsibility. Too hard. Too likely, too, to get you called racist. And in fact, I'm going to finish with one more anecdote that shows you exactly this, this whole stinking thing. There's Aboriginal industry, the ABC left, pushing this dead-end idea that we should keep our Aborigines exactly where they do worse, out bush, even though almost every Aboriginal leader you see in the media lives in cities and big towns, integrated, even assimilated, certainly educated, the big key. In 2015, Prime Minister Tony Abbott, who you know spent a lot of his free time in the past volunteering in Aboriginal communities, said enough. We could not keep funding the welfare ghettos which exist in some places out bush. Fine, by all means live in a remote location, but there's a limit to what you can expect the state to do for you if you want to live there. What we can't do uh, is endlessly subsidise lifestyle choices if those lifestyle choices are not conducive to the kind of full participation in Australian society that everyone should have. But listen to the horror from an ABC interviewer when Abbott said it again, we can't keep them out where there is no work. Her reaction was so typical of the left. And if people choose to live miles away from where there's a school, 
if people choose uh, not to access School of the Air and the other services that are available for people in very, very remote locations. If people choose to live where there's no jobs, obviously it's very, very difficult to close the gap. Because, but are you, uh, you penalising people for living in remote areas there? Isn't that something you should encourage to get people out of the cities? Seriously, you've got to get Aborigines out of the cities where many have done so well? Now, for raising this issue, Tony Abbott was branded a racist, including by the Greens and by United Nations rapporteur, while leader of the Aboriginal leaders of the Aboriginal industry, people who later led the Voice campaign, by the way, lined up to smash Abbott. I think it's a very disappointing and hopeless statement by the Prime Minister. What do you make of Tony Abbott's choice of words here? I think they're poorly thought out. I think um, um, I think they will cause offence in the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander community. On the ABC, AB, uh, Abbott critics, including some identifying as Aboriginal, even claimed that the outback settlements were, were actually wonderful. They were like Eden. And people backing Abbott on this were just dumb. These people haven't been out into the regions to see how these people live. They haven't seen how happy the kids are. They haven't seen uh, the, the power of the elders. Seriously. Enough with the fantasies. Let's now have the honest debate that we have been dodging for half a century or more. Is it really now time to fund integration instead? Not Aboriginal separatism out there. Integration. Joining me from Alice Springs is Sky News Northern Australia correspondent Matt Cunningham. Matt, great to see you. Um, the Prime Minister spent four hours in Alice Springs 14 months ago, announced a lot of spending then to fix the violence among Aboriginal children particularly. What is the situation in Alice Springs today? Well, a lot of people uh, I've been speaking to this week, Andrew, say it's probably worse now than it was 14 months ago. I mean, I, I was here, I spent a week here in January and I've got to say at the time, I thought things were pretty bad. At the time, police were telling me things had improved, particularly when it came to domestic and family violence. That was because in the previous month, they only responded to 550 incidents compared to 700 in a month, uh, 12 months before. So, you know, maybe it had improved a little bit, but God, if you're going from, you know, hideously bad to just a little bit better, it's not really a success story, is it? No. Um, now, we're talking about here, uh, particularly Aborigines, uh, not all from our, uh, remote communities have drifted into town, but also in a, you know, have come into uh, uh, little camps around Alice Springs. Tell us about that confrontation police had there with some one group of armed Aborigines on Tuesday. Yeah, so mu much of the focus about what happened on Tuesday has been on what happened at the Todd Tavern because we've seen that shocking vision of people trying to smash their way into the, uh, the hotel there. Uh, but I think it's more alarming what happened about three hours later at the Hidden Valley Town Camp. It's an Aboriginal town camp uh, that's about two kilometres out of the Darwin CBD, Andrew. Now, according to my sources, um, the police who went to that community on Tuesday night actually got to the point where they had uh, their hands on their guns ready to draw those firearms and potentially use them because of the threat that they were being put under at that time. And you, you played the grab from the police commissioner, uh, Michael Murphy, before. There were 150 people at that community, according to police, who were involved in a disturbance. They were armed with weapons, including uh, axes and machetes, according to police, and they were threatening police uh, with those weapons. So uh, you can only imagine what could possibly have transpired uh, in that situation if police had not done uh, uh, such a good job uh, to quell the violence and keep that situation under control. So what's been the political and police reaction today? Most of the people I've spoken to uh, have been very supportive of the decision that's been made by the Chief Minister, belatedly some would say, to impose a, a curfew here. Uh, in Alice Springs. She has declared an emergency situation following the events of Tuesday uh, and she's implemented that curfew between 6pm and 6am. That means that police have the power uh, to remove any child uh, who is unsupervised, who is on the streets uh, between 
uh, those two uh, time during that time period. Uh, it's been welcomed by people across the political spectrum, I would say. Robin Lambley, the independent conservative politician who's been campaigning for this for some time, was supportive. Uh, Donna Archie uh, from Central Australian Aboriginal Congress, also supportive, as was the Central Land Council. There was some opposition from the Northern Territory Children's Commissioner and from the North Australian Aboriginal Justice Agency, but I think they were the outliers uh, for the most part. Uh, the moves that have been made by the government uh, following those incidents on Tuesday have been well received. But I still think, uh, Matt, it's a Band-Aid, just like the Prime Minister's package was 14 months ago, as I said at the time. I think you said it might have said it even too. Um, Matt, people will say, look, you're talking... Um, here I'm talking about violence in Alice Springs when, you know, it's what's that got to do with uh, the, the outback, funding outback communities, uh, some of them welfare ghettos? The, idea, the thing is, of course, that a lot of these people are coming into uh, Alice Springs from those settlements, often going back as well. Uh, and what's happening in some of those settlements, whether you're talking about Wadair or, or Yundamu sometimes, uh, you know, it's not a, captured on CCTV, so we can ignore it. But in Alice Springs, it isn't. Can you tell me, you probably heard what I was saying, what do you think needs to be done long term? Oh, look, that's a $6 million question, isn't it? I mean, um, you know, I, we, we need to get to a situation where, where Aboriginal people, and I, I speak from a Northern Territory perspective, where, where they, you know, go to school, get an education, um, you know, go on to, to get a, a real meaningful job. But, you know, that just doesn't happen in, in so many cases. And, you know, I heard you make the, the, the point about how few jobs there actually are in some of these remote areas. I mean, we, we have a whole generation now of people who've, and probably more than one generation, of, of people who've really learnt uh, not to work. And, and we're seeing, you know, the, the outcome um, from that now playing out on the streets of Alice Springs. I mean, the Northern Territory's Chief Minister has said she's only been in the job for a few months, but she said, you know, that's her, her number one goal, is to get to a point you know, where, where everyone in the Northern Territory, and, and Aboriginal people in particular, um, are working in real and meaningful jobs. But uh, I think you've already articulated uh, some of the difficulties uh, that they face and some of the difficulties that have been created um, to ensure that they can do that. Matt, under this is a fundamental change. Uh, I think we're just going to be talking to each other about this for a decade to come or ever long we uh, keep working. Matt Cunningham, thank you so much for your... I mean, I've always been an admirer of your work on this issue. You're passionate about it. You're honest about it. Um, look forward to talking to you again, although I hope next time with a bit better news. Thank you for your time. After the break, Anthony Albanese, meanwhile, is boasting of giving your money to a green energy company backed by a billionaire and the very rich Malcolm Turnbull as well. Is this capitalism or Labour-style socialism? And is that going to go bang? Barnaby Joyce. But the Prime Minister today was busy saving us from another crisis. This is the fake climate crisis. Fake, in my opinion. He went to the Hunter Valley to announce he's spending another $1 billion of your money on green energy, on cheap loans and grants, including some for the SunDrive Solar Company run by this young man, whose company was already given $11 million last year from this government, to make cheap solar panels here, instead of having Australians buy almost all of them from China instead. Now, more help is good news for SunDry's big investors, who seem down to their last penny. They include billionaire Mike Cannon-Brooks and their very rich former Liberal Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull. You see, Labor's Green Revolution could be making a mozza from some very rich people. And Albanese promised much more of the same to make a renewable energy technology in Australia with the help of... Of course, much more of your money. We see a future made in Australia as being a centrepiece of our budget in May. Uh, this is, if you like, a bit of a sneak peek. We'll have more to say uh, on the circular economy uh, in the coming period, both in the lead up to the budget and beyond. Joining me is Nationals front bencher Barnaby Joyce, the former Deputy Prime Minister and our Thursday regular guest. Barnaby, lovely to see you again. Hey, most of this, 
money is to replace the Dedell coal-fired power plant in New South Wales, which has just been shut, with solar power in the area. The $1 billion comes on top of the more than $40 billion already promised by Labor to make Australia supposedly a, a renewable energy superpower. Is this a good idea, subsidising businesses already backed by billionaires? It's a, I always say that they're not wind farms. They're not even wind factories. They're swindle factories, swindle factories, where we get walked over and, ladies and gentlemen, you get ripped off, absolutely ripped off. So now you've got, you've got um, renewable energy credits, you've got power purchasing agreements, you've got deemed rates of return, secret, uh, secret agreements between the governments and the proponents of these swindle factories. They, it's all secret. We don't see it. They get a return whether they produce power or not. And now on top of that... They're actually going to subsidise the mechanism for the swindle. They're going to subsidise the construction of the solar panels. Now, the Hunter Valley is a very interesting place because offshore, off Port Stephens, we have a we have a new swindle factory going in out there. A lot of very, very, very unhappy people at Port Stephens. A lot of very, very, very unhappy people in the Hunter Valley. And uh, I hear the Prime Minister, and I think. Uh, the enlightened Minister Bowen, are going up to announce the swindle factory. So I say to the people of Port Stephens and to the New England, go down and say good day to them. Go and say and tell them how happy you are about the thou tens of thousands of kilometres of transmission lines, the filth of cobwebs going all over your all over the countryside, the the bird, the nature killing wind turbines in the swindle factories, the carpeters, the carpeting of black over our environment with solar factories, go and tell. Because, see, Minister Bowen thinks it's great. He thinks you're really happy being ripped off and really happy destroying your environment. He thinks this is a great idea. In fact, it's such a great idea, he's going to give Malcolm Turnbull and Mike Cannon Brooks a little bit of a handout with a billion dollars of your cash. Yeah, but, you, but, you know, what really upsets me, well, it makes me question this particular way of doing business, Barnaby. We saw the Rudd government subsidise, for instance, geothermal plants. Tim Flannery said it was a mozza. It went bang, bust. They cancelled it. They subsidised uh, also wave generators. That was going to be a new frontier. They, two of them crashed or sank and one, in the South, one pl uh, project in West Australia also uh, flopped. I mean, now today, the Prime Minister's asked if these panels that we're going to be helping to subsidise would be cheap enough and good enough for Australians to buy them instead of the cheap Chinese ones we use instead. Here's his answer. These are uh, the most efficient solar panels in the world. These are good products. They will last for longer. Uh, they will be commercially, commercially available. And we are very confident... Uh, that uh, Australians will have Australian panels on their roofs. Now, 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 Barnaby, if they're that great, these products, why do taxpayers need to subsidise them? Turnbull and Cannon Brooks, oh. they can, uh, you know, put this to market. <laughs> Andrew, they've learned from their previous swindles. They've got this one worked out. Not only is the swindle in the subsidisation now of the uh, new swindle factory creating solar panels. We've got the swindle factories that you see all over your countryside and out to sea, but they've made it so you have to purchase power in five-minute blocks. You can sell power in five-minute blocks. It's like selling you the air to breathe in five-minute blocks. And, of course, sometimes the air's really cheap, but if there's no air around, <gasps> it's a bit uncomfortable. And when that happens, the price of air, in this case the price of power, go through the roof. And that's exactly what they want. See, they don't have to supply power for 24 hours a day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a nope. year. They just have to supply it for five minutes. And what a marvellous swindle market to back up your swindle factory. <laughs> it's just, it drives me nuts. As soon as governments pick winners, particularly in this area, you know, it's politics first Business second, you've got no idea what's going to happen with our money. Uh, by the way, Barnaby, uh, yeah, a big win, uh, and give credit to the government uh, for this. Uh, China is uh, dropping its ban on our wine, so 
uh, Albanese was saying, look, uh, we might be able to sell a billion dollars of wine uh, to China now. Um, all that's good for wine growers. I know that. But the one thing that concerns me about all these trade deals that, uh, or, you know, the agreements that the government's making now with China to drop the bans, it imposed on us for being cheeky about, you know, speaking up for democracy, makes us even more economically dependent on China, which gives China a bigger stick to beat us next time. That's the one problem I have with all this focus on let's, let's uh, increase, you know, drop these trade bans. Well, I think you, it's not only that, you should have a look at some of the other things. When you see a deal, there's two sides to it, Andrew. And uh, we now find out that we get to uh, import, they get to sell us more of the swindle towers for the swindle factories. They're, they're the, the so-called wind towers, they come in from China and we've sort of straightened things out there. We've also got rid of ASIO and ASIS out of the National Security Committee because who'd want to have ASIO and ASIS who do issues such as the protection of our nation. Why on earth would you have them in the National Security Committee? So they've been kicked out. And we can kind of stop saying that the problems in the South China Sea and the reason we're going into AUKUS has got anything to do with China. See, it's actually that we're threatened by Fiji or New Zealand or have a little bit of concern about what might turn up for the Antarctic. It's got nothing to do with China anymore. See, and we've just made a few of these changes and, you know, we're starting to learn how to basically do what we're told and for that we're exporting our wine and the, to export our wine's great but make no mistake about it it came as part of a package it came as part of a deal well i'm just worried about our economic dependence on china it was already far 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 too high that's made uh, governments too scared to say much to china and now uh, it's even more but there you go good news though for uh, w wine makers i know that but still Barnaby joyce thank you so much indeed for your time just uh, breaking news. We said on the show, didn't we, uh, that uh, Jackie Lambie, her new party in Tasmania, which uh, the, will probably form government there with the Liberals, we wondered, we wondered, uh, we were speculating how long it would take to fall apart. We were saying maybe six months because the history of these minor political parties, particularly those led by women, Pauline Hanson, is that uh, the people that elected on their coattails soon think they're too good for the, for the person that got them there. Well, the Tasmanian MPs haven't fallen away from Jackie Lambie yet, but Senator Tammy Tyrrell has. She's the other Jackie Lambie senator in Parliament. Uh, there were two of them, Jackie Lambie and Tammy Tyrrell. Tammy Tyrrell's now quit the party, saying she's lost confidence in Jackie Lambie that put her there in the first place. She says she's going to continue to represent the Tasmanian people in the federal parliament as an independent, but seriously, the ingratitude. Well, after the break, the price of paying stupid or playing stupid politics against Israel. The Sydney Theatre Company now forced to dismiss up to 20 staff. Should we feel sorry? Deborah Conway and Michael Danby after this. Now, I should have said actually, it's a bit of karma come to Jackie Lambie to have her her fellow senator, her fellow Lambie senator quit on her because Lambie herself quit on Clive Palmer. Remember that? She got elected on Clive Palmer's coattails uh, thanks to his giant wallet and within 14 months she'd quit the Palmer United Party to strike out on her own. So uh, what comes around goes round. Oh. Anyway, so there you go. Ah, sad news. Oh, it should be sad news. So why am I not so sad? I should be sad. You remember how actors hijacked the curtain call of a Sydney theatre company production of The Seagull to put on Palestinian scarves to protest against Israel? Well, the backlash from donors and subscribers has been so bad that, oh dear, the company is now very short of money, which means up to 20 staff could now lose their jobs, which is bad luck for them. But maybe the actors now will realise that political stupidity and showboating does have a price. And something else about this also makes me wonder. Why are so many Jews, Jews in positions of cultural power resigning in protest over this kind of activism rather than stay and fight like hell? I mean, yeah, listen... I've got a little list. At the Sydney Theatre Company, three Jewish Foundation board members actually quit in protest including the son of fashion icon Carla Zampatti. 
Then there's Maurice Schwartz. He publishes the Far Left Monthly and the Far Left Saturday paper and he stepped aside as chairman. After his own journalist demanded Israeli spokesman be treated with no more trust than Hamas terrorists. Well, he says there's no connection with the, between that and his decision to step aside. Well, I bet. Debbie Dadon quit the board of Malthouse Theatre after it let pro-Palestinian activist Clementine Ford appear on the same night as a performance of Yentl, would you believe? Jewish academics have been quitting Australia's biggest tertiary education union in protest against its anti-Israeli stand. The deputy chairman of the Melbourne Writers Festival quit over a festival program note claiming falsely that both Aboriginal, Palestinian, Aboriginal activists and Palestinians were fighting colonialism. Joining me earlier today were two Australians, both Jews, who most certainly are fighting, they're not quitting, singer Deborah Conway and former Federal Labor MP Michael Danby. Deborah Conway, Michael Danby, thank you both so much for your time. First of you, Deborah, the Th Sydney Theatre Company, your reaction to the news, that there's been such a reaction to the actors playing politics on stage that up to 20 theatre uh, employees now could lose their jobs. Oh, it's just devastating for uh, for the Sydney Theatre Company and it's um, it's appalling for all of the employees uh, who are um, who are going to lose their their jobs of course absolutely um, it's it's possibly was uh, well it just an awful unintended consequence of um, of the Sydney Theatre Company's inability to come out uh, swinging and um and not and not uh, being able to say we we can't we can't um count countenance uh this kind of protest uh for our for our patrons um who are who haven't come to see politics they've come to see theater and uh and we apologize wholeheartedly for for that. Well, it's on the theatre company too, really, isn't it, Michael? It's not just the actors who thought, uh, let's just flaunt uh, the pro-Palestinian cause in front of their face, whether they're uh, Jewish or, or pro-Israel or whatever, it doesn't matter. We, we're on the stage, we're going to do it. It's also on the company itself. Well, uh, it's, it's a disaster for them. I mean, it's paradigm of uh, go woke, go broke. Um, I mean, don't, don't these people, as Deborah said, understand that if you go along to a, see uh, The Crucible or Seagull or whatever the play was, that you don't expect to have politics rammed down your throat? You're sitting there in the theatre. You're forced to participate in this uh, charade. But I suppose those three actors who did it don't care. The extremists who are dominating our streets don't care. The extremists who are doxing, um, you know, members of other theatrical organisations don't care. They don't care about the record of these people. Marvellous philanthropists who, you know, for, out of the goodness of their hearts, just support um, writing, theatre, etc. But then, of course, you have the Adelaide Writers' Festival and they're employing uh, uh, the head hater, Louise Adler. And she has the cheek to say that people... Uh, she can't find anyone to debate her. Michael Gawinda's written a whole book about his falling out with her, and he would never be invited to the Adelaide Writers' Festival because he would expose her on stage. But, Deborah, so something that I raised uh, before that disturbs me, the number of prominent Jews who are actually resigning in protest from the boards of these cultural organisations uh, is someone from the... Uh, three of them from the uh, foundation of the Sydney Theatre Company... Uh, another that from the Melbourne Writers Festival. You've even got Maurice Schwartz stepping aside as uh, chairman of his own <laughs> of his own publications. I mean, rather than stay and fight, and now I know it's tough to stand up to the left. My God, do you know how hard it's been? But shouldn't they? Uh, look, I think everybody's individual, and everybody can take as much heat as they can take. But uh, in conversations I've been having with people and my observations of what's going on, I understand that it's not, it's not so much that people are protesting and then resigning. They're trying to fight within their organisations and on their boards to be heard. And they're not being heard. In fact, they're being um, minimised and ignored 
and in some cases slightly vilified. And, you know, you can only fight that for so long before you just think, well, perhaps I'm just not being in any way effective, so I should possibly find better places to put my energy. And that's, I think, probably but more uh, a, a more accurate description of what's been going on. May, you may be right. I don't know. Uh, Michael, your thoughts? Well, these people don't sign up to be involved in heavy politics like I did or to be on uh, a, a really um, out there television network like you, Andrew. Uh, they're, they're, they're people in business. They're, they're, they're softer. They're, they're creatives. They're, um, you know, it's very hard for them. I mean, I know one woman who's had her children doxxed, their business doxxed. Um, uh, that that um, Caroline, uh, whatever her name is, uh, I, I won't pronounce her last name to give her credit, but it just terribly affects all of the people around you. It's pure politics. It's pure bigotry. And, you know, the fact that other people, as Deborah pointed out on these uh, theatrical boards, don't stand up to it, they'd never do it if it was um, uh, Indigenous people. They'd never do it if it was other minorities. And it's just because of the war in Gaza, it's fashionable. These people are fashionistas and they're disgusting. And the history will come to judge all of those people who fail to stand up. Well, all the more credit to you, Deborah Conway, Michael Danby. Thank you so much to you both. Thanks, Andrew. After the break, this is extraordinary. The government won't tell you how many of the foreign murderers it released on our streets last year don't have to wear ankle monitors. And you won't believe why it won't say. I mean, their privacy? Plus my book and whiskey of the week, both from people in my neighbourhood. And what's wrong with one of them? I heard something absolutely extraordinary last night from Senator Decimus hearing in Canberra. You are not allowed to know if any of the seven foreign murderers and attempted murderers that the Albanese government released late last year from immigration detention are being tracked with ankle bracelets. There's an assassin out there. There are killers out there. And you can't know if they're being monitors the government promised. Now, Senator James Patterson was astonished, as I am, to hear that 73 of the 149 free detainees were not wearing ankle monitors and that the head of the government's Immigration and Border Force would not tell him if those 73 included any of the killers or the dozens of sex offenders released as well. Of the 73, um, what crimes have they previously committed? Are there any of them among, among them, the seven murderers, for example? I don't have that breakdown of data. I said that these were issues that I was going to raise and that I expected answers to. I assure you it's of interest to the community to know whether there are any people who previously committed a murder who are now free in the community without even ankle bracelets on. With such small numbers of people, I mean, we're talking about 150 people, we have to be careful about privacy as well and identifying individuals. I don't want to know who they are, where they're from. I just want to know, how about the sex offenders? There were 37 of those. Are any of them in the community at the moment not wearing an ankle bracelet? And we took that on notice and we took the question as well. Anyone watching this hearing will see an attempt, an apparent attempt, to cover up and protect oh, the government's so interests here. Patterson. I think. Joining me are James McPherson of the Late Debate here on Sky at 10pm and... Louise Elliott, business consultant and Hobart City Councillor. James, is that fair enough that the government won't tell you if the murderers it's freed are wearing ankle braces? Because, you know, privacy, James, they're privacy. And it might be unfair on the board that actually makes these calls. I mean, seriously? Yeah, it's pretty tough on the government, isn't it? They've got to try and work out what's their priority, the privacy of non-citizen murderers or the safety and welfare of the Australian public whom they are appointed to represent. And they've decided to go with the privacy of non-citizen murderers. <laughs> I, I mean, if there's one murderer without an ankle bracelet or six or all seven, that doesn't mean we're going to be able to identify this person. But worse, they then hide behind the expert board that they appointed, which makes me wonder if that's why they appointed an expert board in the first place. So this is what you've got, Andrew. You've got the government protecting the expert board. You've got the expert board protecting the privacy of non-citizen murderers, which begs the question, who's protecting the welfare of the Australian citizens? 
Look, Louise Elliott, it might be a, a good reason why some of these murderers do not have ankle bracelets. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe. But if there's a good reason, then I'm sure the public, uh, most of us will accept it. Why not tell us? There is no good reason for that. And there's no good reason as to why these fair and important and expected questions could not be asked. I actually have a feeling that someone might have said, you know, if you can't say anything nice, as in nicely reflect on me, please don't say anything at all, which is something my mum's tried to say yeah. to me in the past quite um, and failed. I don't really follow that advice very well. But I think, as James said, the Australian public deserves answers. These are important questions. They had the heads up that they were coming. They are straightforward, easy to answer questions. We're not asking for full names and GPS locations. Answer the fair questions. And I suspect that, the, well, an easy answer would be, no, of course they're all seven are wearing ankle bracelets. Uh, then you don't bre breach their privacy. The fact that it wasn't said suggests that maybe not uh, they mm. all aren't. Uh, I don't know. I, uh, it's weird. Um, to the Australian Football League, James, the AFL is accused of condoning athletes who've tested positive for drug use in tests by their club doctors for private tests, but positive for recreational drugs, you know, cocaine or whatever, whatever, not performance enhancing ones. And they do this uh, and, and then they tell their player, well, then claim you're injured so you don't have to get tested on game day and get suspended, sit out the game rather than fail a formal drug test. Now, the AFL says it's all about helping athletes get over any drug problems, you know, it's a concern for the athletes. Liberal Senator James Patterson, who we just saw before, says it's a scandal. Here he is. Sounds to me like it's a three strikes rule unless you're a, a star player. And that's, that's a scandal, a major scandal. That's Senator everywhere at the moment. Um, what do you make of this, James? Uh, is it a scandal or fair enough? I liked Senator James Patterson, but on this one, I disagree with him. If you're caught on game day using drugs, the AFL have a three strikes policy, which includes fines, suspension from games, public shaming. But what they're talking about here is if a player self-reports to the club doctor and says, hey, I had a big weekend, I took some drugs, I want to make sure they're not still in my system so I don't take the field illegally, and the doctor does a test and finds, yes, you do have drugs in your system, then the doctor prevents him from playing that's a good thing. So they're keeping the integrity of the game. They tell a little furphy about why the player's not playing. He's got a cold. He pulled a hamstring. Well, I think that's better and preferable to shaming 18, 19-year-old kids in front of the entire nation. And it retains that player-doctor confidentiality where if a player knows I can be honest with my doctor, then he will be and he can receive some good counsel and advice. I think the AFL are doing a good thing here and I don't think they should be criticised for it. Louise, I tend to agree with James. I mean, for, for one, that the player is being punished as being dropped by, from the game, so that's already yep. something. But no club would do this again and again and again without getting really dirty on that player and imposing real sanctions. So it's not as if, ah, oh, you know, it's all a laugh and you can do it and keep doing it. What do you make of it? Uh, for the first time, I'm going to disagree with both of you. I actually think it's Good. a situation where... Um, I find the whole situation actually pretty quite stupid and arrogant. Of course you're going to get caught. Of course you can't have tests before the test. Of course there are consequences of playing an elite level sport, which you're very well uh, rewarded for. And knowing the rules are, you know, you're role models for our kids. You're very well highly regarded by our country. Follow the rules. If you can't uh, back off the drugs, um, then don't play the sport. And also the, the excuse that it's around helping players with addiction, I also find hard to believe because the best thing for addiction is realising if you do that, you will lose your AFL career. So I think a lot of people would make the um, smart choice there. Well, there is that too. A, a bigger disincentive might uh, stop them, but I, I don't know. I, I think they are being punished, but... But quickly, uh, while we've got time, James, have we lost sight of the real Aboriginal problems that need fixing? We've been talking about children running right in Alice Springs, yeah. breakdown of law and order in some communities. It's just terrible. Um, meanwhile, the Victorian government is boasting that it is on the case with Aboriginal disadvantage because it's helped an Aboriginal-owned business to produce uh, contemporary designs for clients, an Aboriginal-owned business owned by this couple. Now, they seem very nice people and very successful, but is this really the most urgent use of the money that we 
give two politicians suspend to add end Aboriginal disadvantage? No, this is not what the public would be expecting when they hear the government is doing things about Aboriginal disadvantage. In fact, I think it's quite insulting to assume that because a person is Indigenous or has Indigenous heritage, they must therefore be disadvantaged. Disadvantage comes in all walks of life, doesn't depend upon necessarily your skin colour. This couple, who seem like very nice people, and they were uh, sent to Texas for a business conference, they were given special mentoring, they were given special assistance that non Indigenous business people could not be given. And I don't blame them for taking it up. After all, the government are offering it. But uh, just to get special compensation and help because of your racial background seems to be a little insulting and uh, certainly is not helping the people that really need it. You've got a couple here who do Indigenous graphic art on their Apple Mac computer. I don't think that's disadvantage that needs taxpayer help. No, uh, I'm afraid of out of time. James McPherson, Louise Elliott, thank you both for your help. Now, my tip for book of the week today is one that I haven't actually read. It's this, Sanctuary, which is another crime thriller by Gary Disher, who's now written about 60 books, won prizes in, for them in Germany, of all places. Um, and the reason, though, that I... Oh, as always, by the way, you can find this book and uh, you know, look at my other previous tips on Robinson's Bookshop webpage. There's a little thing on the left that usually gives them... Oh, look, there's my face on the top. So go, go there and they'll order it for you. Now, the reason I recommend it, despite having not read it, is that although I haven't read that particular one, I have read plenty more by Gary Disher, who's a local, not far from where I live, and... And some of them are actually set, and these, many of these, are set in the area I live in, part of Victoria's Morning to Potential. One is even set in my town and complains about people coming in and tearing down the old fibro homes and building castles instead. And for that, I say, sorry, Gary, sorry about my part in that destruction. But I love the local. Don't we all now, with the rest of the world going off its rocker? But one false note, I've got to say, got to say to Gary, one false note, about the books. I actually love how Hastings Up the Road is renamed Waterloo, things like that. But how come a policeman hero in one of these books buys the left-wing Age newspaper, has the left-wing SBS on his news feed and gives presents of a book by a left-wing author, Gideon Haig? Gary, I'm a former police reporter. I know that most police I know, at least, read the Herald Sun. They aren't left-wing, apart from Police Command, of course. Still, great books. Do yourself a favour and buy them. My whiskey is also local, up from, uh, made from up the road in Somerville. Chief's Sun, one of its 90, 900 standard releases. This one's a big 58% alcohol, but it's balanced. It's not raw and rough. Sherried, lovely. The, one of the owners uh, is Stuart McIntosh, used to be in the army, got in this business because he won a competition by Shivas Regal. In 25 words or less, tell us why you'd like to visit Scotland. He won, he went, he thought, boy, I can make this stuff too. And he was right. Happy Easter, everyone. Have a great time. That's it from me, Sherry Markson, up next.